uh, so recording has started uh, so once again uh, good afternoon all of you okay if you remember in the last class uh, we you know discussed about uh, you know democracy of uh, ancient period greek period democracy uh, in medieval period and democracy in the modern period and today uh, we will uh, we will be discussing on classical liberal theory of democracy and uh, different kinds of you know democracy in the latter part of the lecture now this uh, classical liberal theory of democracy you know it is one aspect of the uh, you know overall philosophy of liberalism right so this uh, you know modern day concept of democracy is uh, derived from the liberal philosophy and uh, what is this uh, you know liberal philosophy or philosophy of liberalism uh, you can uh, you know there are many uh, you know uh, manifestation of you know liberal or liberalism or liberal philosophy uh, you know in a philosophical sense uh, liberalism means uh, all about individualism uh, that is prioritizing individual over the group right so the part is more important than the whole and because part is constituting the whole uh, hence they you know have faith on individual reason uh, individual rationality individual capacity they give importance to individual uh, freedom right and the political base of liberalism is uh, the secularism the liberty equality fraternity right justice so these are uh, the manifestation of liberalism uh, in political sense and uh, you know the basis of political power the basis of political power in liberal philosophy is all about consent you know consent plays a very important role uh, so far as the legitimacy of the authority is concerned right uh, the authority exercises uh, its power and people obey the authority why because you know people has agreed that that person i mean for hobbes it is leviathan for locke it is uh, the civil government and for rousseau it is the general will now leviathan civil government and general will uh, you know they exercise power because people have given their consent to those uh, you know of, you know uh, i will say that to those authority and hence there is no revolution and uh, authority can you know manage the state affairs so that's how consent has a bigger role in the democracy so simultaneously people are joining and the mode of government the mode of government from you know liberal philosophy point of view is limited liberal democratic state with representative government it's limited liberal democratic state limited means the state is for individual the individual is not for the state the state have control or can control over the individual as long as it is beneficial for the individual the state cannot override the individual's interest the state should not uh, you know uh, should not uh, play its hegemonic role over the individual right and uh, you know uh, these are these are the philosophy of you know liberalism or these are main aspects of the liberal philosophy so number 1 it is all about individualism it is all about secularism liberty equality fraternity justice right it is all about consent and it is all about limited liberal democratic state or limited government in other words we can say that it's limited government so uh, you know 
democracy as i have defined earlier democracy is both a way of life and democracy is also a mode of government right so as a way of life and as a mode of government democracy is a means to realize the liberal values since it is derived from liberal philosophy the goal of democracy is to achieve or realize the liberal values principles aims and objectives and what are those liberal values principles and aims and objectives in earlier classes i have already discussed overall it means res accepting and respecting others accepting and respecting others so long as they accept and respect you right so that is a democracy in a very simple term we can define democracy as that uh, it, it is a means to realize the liberal values and what is the liberal values liberal values all about respecting and accepting others so long as they accept and respect you so in a in a sense democracy always talks about the middle path so democracy is not about the extreme path it is always about the middle path democracy madhyam marg that is democracy so it is a means for the integration of all citizens into the community and of creating a just state of which plato and aristotle spoke long ago so democracy no doubt it is all about the you know individual freedom but then all individual has the freedom right so freedom doesn't mean that that you are free to do anything and everything no uh, if you do then you are interfering others freedom so you have to respect other freedom that is the that is the limitation of exercising freedom in a democracy there is a beautiful sentence i think in the earlier classes i have said it that is i have the right to swing my hand until and unless it touches your nose so till my hand is touching your nose i am free if I, if it touches your nose then i am not free restriction must, must be uh, there on me so what is the purpose of democracy the purpose of democracy is the integration so integration of, of all free individual provided they must not encroach each others right or freedom so it is the integration of free citizen into a community into a community in that community all are free but one limitation then no one has the right to encroach the others freedom right so democracy is a means for the integration of all citizen into a community and by creating such a community you know until and unless democracy becomes your way of life you cannot create such a community and when you create such a community then you are also creating a just state so a just community creates a just state and this just state has already been given importance no long ago by plato and aristotle so what is important democracy must create a just community and just community can strengthen a just or just community can work towards a just state right so besides uh, you know plato and aristotle uh, the classical liberal theory of democracy was gradually developed with Uh, the sound philosophical and ideological principles of great philosophers like hobbes locke rousseau bentham james stuart mill now all these philosophers in their writing they have strengthened 
the concept of democracy or the theory of liberal democracy. So let's come to the hops, right? So uh, let me ask you that what you know about the hops? Who is hops? Can anyone tell me who is hops? Now it's over to you. I hope that you can listen or you are listening to me. Can anyone tell me who is Hobbes? Have you heard his name? Yes, anyone can see. Yes, sir. Okay, tell me, tell me something mm -hmm. about him. Sir, Hobbes. Social contextualist. Okay, Jharana, Jharana, I am giving you this scope. You can uh, unmute your video. And you can tell, since it is recording, I mean, uh, you will find yourself in the recording. So, Dharana, please. Sir, uh, Hobbes is a social contractualist. Okay. What is social? I mean, tell something and tell uh, at least two or three lines about Hobbes. He stated uh, as human human nature is bad. Yes. Can you say something more or? No sir. Okay, okay Rinki. Okay, Rinki. You can continue. Said that um, human nature is nasty, brutish, and selfish. Yes. Sir, the, Hobbes is an individualist. Uh, yes. Why, Puja, why you think that Hobbes is an individualist? Why you think that Hobbes is an individualist? Because he gives more, more important to individuals. Individual. Okay, so Lakshmi, you were telling something. Sir, Hobbes, where there is no common power, there is no law, where no law, no justice, Jenai say monarchy, Rakotile. I was saying, my mother gets birth to twins, myself and Fiorki, said John Madejan. Oh, great, great. So, so thank you, thank you for your participation. I think if I'll teach you the hops, then I can say you many things about him, about his personal life and about his philosophy. Now here I think we will briefly discuss, uh, you know, how Hobbes in his philosophy has contributed uh, to the concept of uh, democracy, right? Uh, you know, Hobbes for the first time, you know, he for the first time he introduced state as the result of a contract, right? So who made the contract? There is a contract among the people. There is a contract among the people. And why people made a contract? why they wanted to establish a power or a authority called Leviatha. There he has given the justification. He has established the social contractual theory. And according to that theory for Hobbes, initially, individuals where they are in the state of nature or you can say that they were living in a jungle life was nasty brutish and sought in the state of nature because state of nature was guided by a law of nature and what is the law of nature that might is the right the big face 
has every right to eat this small fish that was the law of nature prevailing in the state of nature and that's why the state of nature was a sphere where there was a war among all there was war among all and a result you know people were very much in a very insecure position so i may be stronger than you so you are weak i am strong so you are always in tension that i can kill you and someone is also stronger than me so i am also thinking that i can kill you but someone can kill me so i am also in the tension that was the state of nature and to live without fear people wanted to establish a power a authority and that authority is the leviathan right so the leviathan will protect all individuals from that fear and it is the duty of leviathan to protect the natural rights of the individual and what are the natural rights right to life right to liberty and right to property these are the natural rights so it is the duty of leviathan to protect the natural right so it is the duty of the leviathan to protect the natural right if leviathan cannot protect the natural right then there will be many for hops i think uh, no there is no no i think it is there actually for hops if the leviathan will not protect the natural right then people can throw that authority then they can establish another authority who can protect their natural right so hops is the first you know philosopher who justified state on the basis of social contractualist theory right and another important thing of hobbesian social contractualist theory is that that once the state is established then the state cannot allow you to kill yourself you do not have to commit suicide you do not have any right to commit suicide if the state if the leviathan wants then the leviathan can kill you but leviathan cannot allow you to kill yourself so this is a brief idea about the leviathan so for hops state and government is created by the people through social contract so the commonwealth or leviathan may exercise its sovereign power with certain condition the sovereign power or the leviathan is absolutely free in the state but there are certain conditions did lebhia tha sir sir i have yes. a question sir yes sir who is lebhia tha lebhia tha is a authority lebhia tha is a authority i mean that is in hobbes context the authority is called the lebhia tha right sir lebhia tha so, yes sir lebhia tha is among them or he is not among them yes yes people will as among them one individual i mean elebhyatha is sir. belonging from the i mean belonging to the people they are among Thank them you, only sir. right sir. they consented him that mr x will be our elebhyatha mr x will be our king our chief our authority and that authority is absolutely free provided that authority has to protect 
the life, liberty and property. Right? Now for Hobbes, if the Leviatha is one individual, then it is called monarchy. If the Leviatha is few individual, then it is called the aristocracy. And if the Leviatha is all individual, then it is called democracy. So Hobbes had said it. He either all people can become Leviatha or some people can become Leviatha or one individual can be the Leviatha. If the one individual is Leviatha, then the form of or the commonwealth will be or the state will be a monarchical state. If some are Leviatha, then it is aristocracy. If all are Leviatha, then it is democracy. And our conception of representative you know, democracy today falls under the Hobbesian category of aristocratic government. You know, what Hobbes was talking about aristocracy, that it is ruled by some. And today, in a representative form of government, even if people elect their representative, but power is not in the hand of people. Power is with that representative. So, our conception of a representative democracy falls under the Hobbesian category of aristocratic government. And Hobbes see a little distinction between democracy and aristocracy as a form of government. So, at least Hobbes was against that power should not be concentrate, concentrated in the hand of one individual. Right? Even aristocracy is also a form of, I mean, also a you know kind of democratic government because the power is in the hand of few. So, if the power is concentrated in the hand of one individual, then there is no possibility of check and balance system. You know, there is a nice slogan, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So, if it is with few person, then there will be a kind of check and balance system. Right? And one individual will check and another individual and as a result, democracy or democratic principles is bind, bound to be implemented. So, hence, Hobbes sees little distinction between democracy and aristocracy as a form of government. The sovereignty may limit itself internally, but not externally. So, there is internal limitation to the sovereignty, but not the externally. It means the sovereignty, the Leviatha, is externally, total, totally, you know, absolutely, he is free. But internally, the Leviatha is not free. Why the Leviatha is not free? Because, because of three conditions. That the Leviatha will protect the life, liberty and property of the individual. These are the three limitations of Leviatha and that's why Leviatha is not 100% internally free. However, externally Leviatha is 100% free. So, Hobbes, what he contributed to, a, to, the, to the, you know, classical liberal theory of democracy, Hobbes contributed the concept of contract, the concept of consent, the concept of natural rights, that is life, liberty, property, and the concept of aristocracy, the concept of, uh, the concept of sovereignty. Now, these are various concepts of democracy, what Hobbes has contributed in his philosophy. And next is John Locke. Wait for a minute. 
Next is John Locke. And John Locke, uh, you know, uh, John Locke pleads for limited and constitutional government and natural rights of men. His important work, Treatise of the Government, is directed against the arbitrary rule if it is against the fundamental rights and liberty. The great protection which Locke offers against absolutism is the doctrine of consent. Right? Locke is also a social contractualist. You know, what Hobbes has said, Locke has added to that philosophy. But there is an important distinction between the Hobbes and Locke. What is that important distinction? Now, they are conceptualization of state, especially their conceptualization of state of nature. The difference between the Hobbes and Locke on the state of nature was that for Hobbes, the state of nature was nasty, brutish, and sought. And the need of a state is because of there is a problem so far as security of the individual is concerned. And that's why Hobbes, uh, you know, he uh, talked about the need of creating an authority called Lebhyantha. But for Locke, the state of nature was absolutely fine, was absolutely good, was absolutely, you know, there, there was peace in the state of nature. But then, why Hobbes talked about civil society? Why Locke talked about the state? Can anyone tell me? If the state of nature was good, then why Locke talked about civil society and the state? I am throwing this question to all of you. Can anyone tell me? Sir? Yes, Puja. Uh, according to Locke, uh, men are rational beings, but in that time, the state of nature, state of nature is, uh, according to Locke, state of nature is good. But, uh, in that time, uh, everyone, every into every every individual, are every individual are every individual, everyone yes. against everyone. So there is, so there was no no supreme no no no, no, Puja, no Puja. I mean, all individuals state. were good. Yes, Mukesh. So state is necessary just to maintain law and order in society. No. I mean, since state of nature was peace, so there was no need of maintaining the law and order. So what was not there? What was not there in the state of nature? Supreme authority. Yes, there was no authority and people were thinking, if some conflict will arise among the people, then how to resolve that conflict? So that thought pushed luck towards creating an authority. And how the authority will come? The authority will come through consent. And here Locke talked about two kinds of consent. So one is the active consent, another is the tacit consent. What is the active consent? What is the active consent? And what is a tacit consent? For Locke, there is two kinds of contract. Contract that is based on active consent and contract that is based on the tacit consent. So Locke has, Locke, Locke has, uh, Locke, Locke, for Locke, you know, there is a transition of society from state of nature to civil society. So when society, you know, is changing or transmitting from uh, state of nature to civil society, then it is happening through a contract based on the active consent. So active consent means your active consent. It needs your signature. 
and what is the tacit consent now once civil society is established then automatically civil society will create a state so since civil society is based on the active consent of the individual then civil society has all the power to establish a representative government and that government will represent that civil society and civil society it's constituting you know all individuals so this is i mean both are hobbs and locke both are contractualists but this is the main difference between the hobbs and locke so the important work of locke two treatises of the government why two treatises why two treatises there because in one treaty the civil society is coming into existence and in the another treaty the state is coming into the existence right and another important thing is that if the government unable to and similarity thing between the hobbs and locke is that that authority is constituted in order to protect life liberty and property of the individual natural rights of the individual should be protected by the authority and hobbes is silent if the authority unable to protect the natural rights what should be happen to the authority hobbes is silent on that but locke is vocal on it for locke if the authority cannot protect all these natural rights then people can overthrow that authority people have every right to overthrow that authority immediately right so the great protection which of lock offers against absolute absolutism is the doctrine of the consent and why people can overthrow that authority because people have established that authority through their consent authority has to respect that consent if authority cannot respect that consent then people have every right to remove that authority so the existence of state is only justified because it preserves the natural rights of the individual at so at soon age it fails people have every right to overthrow it that is the consent role of consent the relation between community and the government and here i am i am saying community means a civil society the relation between civil society and government is not contract rather than the trust you know i, I said there is a active consent and there is a passive sorry active uh, active consent and there is a passive consent and active consent is called contract so contract is the active consent and the passive consent or tacit consent the right term will be the tacit consent and tacit consent is actually the trust so once the civil society you know it comes into existence through active consent through the contract but when the government you know comes into existence it is based on trust because people have trusted the civil society and civil society will do anything that is for the people so the civil society can establish the government so people directly for hobbes people were directly you know establishing the government but for locke people are establishing government indirectly through civil society that is the difference <laughs> the principles of democratic state propounded by locke can be summed up as follows and what are those 
democratic principles or the principles of democratic state what is reflected in the lockean philosophy the past it is based on the consent of the people and what is the role of consent that if the authority if the government cannot protect the natural right then according to the principles of consent the people can overthrow that king or overthrow that government that is the principles of consent and the state exists for the people the state exists for the people or government exists for the people not vice versa people don't exist for the state the state is exist a state exist for the people third it is a constitutional state by ruled by or governed by the rule of law even the king is also guided by the rule of law the king is not above the law the state is not above the law so rule of law is applicable for individual for groups for rulers as well then it is limited not absolute it is a limited government why it is a limited because if you cannot protect all these natural rights people can remove you and that's why it is limited you are bound to protect the natural rights then it is a tolerant state the state will show toleration to the diversity among people the state should tolerate the individual while they exercise their freedom so basically state is for the individual the state is for the individual then it protects the natural right which is inalienable right life liberty and property these are the inalienable right and the state protects the natural right it's the duty of the state to protect the natural right so the first two principles that is based on the consent of the people and it exists for the people not vice versa this is all about the individualism and 3 and 4 that is it is a constitutional government governed by rule of law and it is a limited not absolute government it is all about the constitutional government and the rest too it is a tolerant state and it it, it protects the natural right which is inalienable these are all about the popular sovereignty so lockean philosophy has contributed towards individualism towards constitutional government and towards popular sovereignty for lock every individual is unique and have respect only a tolerant state can protect the both so every individual is unique every individual has respect and the state through the policy of toleration should protect the uniqueness of the individual and to protect dignity of the individual and to give respect to the individual the state will respect to the individual so this is briefly about the lockean philosophy and its contribution to classical liberal theory of democracy then another important philosopher which has contributed to the democracy that is rousseau rousseau in his book social contract upholds the ideal of liberal liberal democracy the whole thrust of his philosophy lies in the following three simple principles so anyone 
who wants to ask something lucy lucy sahu do you want to ask something you have any question so far no i think the whole thrust of russo's philosophy lies in following three simple principles the past that men are by nature free and equal men by nature are free and equal second rights of the government must be based on some compact freely entered into by these equal and independent individuals and third the only compact becomes an indivisible part of a body that retains the inalienable rights of the individual determines its own internal constitution and legislation right and these are three simple principles these are the the whole thrust of his philosophy lies in the following three principles so russia uh, you know the philosophy of russia can be summed up by these three points so one man is by nature free and equal so all individuals are born free hence there is a natural equality among all individuals and the state should maintain this that natural natural equality the state should not overemphasize some at the cost of some in the perspective of the state every individual counts no all individuals are equal because they are born equal by nature they are free and they are equal and the rights of the government must be based on the government must, must be based on by some compact freely entered into by these equal and independent individual so all these individual who are equal and free they will make a contract to establish the government or the general with and third the only compact becomes an indivisible part of the body that retains the inalienable right of the individual it's the same thing if the body or the government which is result of that compact which is result of that contract if the government retains the inalienable rights of the individual that is the natural rights of the individual then that body or that authority has every right to determine its internal constitution and legislation and people will follow that so there are a lot of similarities between hobbes locke and rousseau for them state is created for the individual let me tell you how rousseau is different from hobbes and locke can anyone tell me how rousseau is different i mean the tricky point is that what was the nature of state of nature for rousseau and how it was different from the state of nature of hobbes and locke and why people entered into a compact and people wanted to establish the concept of general will for rousseau the body that authority is called the general will so what was the lacuna in the state of nature for rousseau can anyone tell me can anyone tell me what was the problem of or problem in state of nature for rousseau anyone
सर यस दोस्तों सर कंप्लीट सरेंडर ऑफ इंडिविजुअल राइट अंडर द कम्युनिटी नो व्हाट वाज द प्रॉब्लम इन द स्टेट ऑफ नेचर फॉर रूसो एंड व्हाई पीपल इन स्टेट ऑफ नेचर वांटेड टू एस्टेब्लिश जनरल विल Why? It is because of the concept of property. So everything was fine for Russia. Everything was fine in the state of nature. But when the first person occupy and land and said that this is my land, this is not yours. It is because of the land because of the property not only the state of nature become the state of so russo's russo's state of nature started with log state of nature but it is because of the introduction of private property russo's state of nature becomes or became the hop state of nature and you know one of the natural right is all about right to life liberty and property so right to property is there so to protect the right to property primarily russo entered into a contract and in in his book it is written compact right so there is you know that free equal and independent individual they made a compact with one another and they established the general will so for russo it is the will not the force that is the basis of the state right and let me tell you and i have already said it to my student that's a very tricky question it is often asked in various interview board that what is a general will can anyone tell me the constitution of general will mili i hope mili you are my department student yes sir okay now tell me general will is the collective will of the community uh what yes any 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 other person general will is the collective interest of all individual living in a society okay any other mukesh are you there sir it is what is good and best for the society as a whole oh theek hai mukesh are you there Uh, yes sir her uh, will is the best will of every individual or general is the uh, real will of the people uh, again again mil tell me again her uh, general will is the best will of every individual and it is the uh, real will best will okay mukesh sir uh yeah. general okay, means uh, uh, yes yes okay let let mukesh okay, speak then shiva will come uh, sir uh, general will means uh, first uh, there are uh, private will private will mean uh, mean a individual uh, mean individually he benefit and general will is the will by that will whole community will benefited mean the will of a community okay shiva uh, sir okay, you, uh, you want to add okay wait wait amoke uh, you want to say something more no sir no, let let shiva speak okay uh, shiva sir uh, general will is the sum of real will uh, which serve common interest or common good yes and what is will of all okay so trilochan 
Trilochan, are you our uh, department student or you are private cell student? Department student. Okay. Okay. Do you want to speak? What is the difference uh, between will of all and general will? The general will is real, real will of the individual. Uh, no, I think Siba has said one part, but how to understand? I mean, each and every individual has two kinds of will. I have two kinds of will. Yeah. You have two kinds of will. Yeah, Dorothy, yeah, please. Yeah, uh, general will is associated with the common interest of the people. Or the you will is driven by the private interest. So I oh. think in uh, in Russo's uh, uh, concept, maybe he was trying to say the state has to be to be driven by the general will, like the common interest for people, not to be driven by the uh, private interest, which is the real will. Oh, great, great, great. I mean, uh, everyone you know said something, you know. Uh, but somehow Durati, uh, you know, she came close to the answer. Let me say you all, you know, for your better understanding, that each and every individual has two kinds of will. I have two wills, you have two, you all have two wills. And what are the two wills? One is the actual will, another is the real will. And what is the actual will? Actual will is based on my selfish interest. That means, I will think about my own interest. I will not bother about your interest. Even at the cost of your interest, I will try to gain you know, advantages. That is my selfish interest. So some wills of mine are based on completely self-interest, selfish interest. The difference between the self-interest and selfish interest is that selfish interest is all about satisfying your interest at the cost of others. And self-interest is all about thinking about your interest, but not by damaging others' interest. And we can say that something which is related with the common good. And in the common good, if you concentrate, then you are not going against others and you are going for yourself. And when you are going for yourself, you are also going for others. That is the self-will. So every individual says two kinds of will. One is actual will, and another is the real will. Now the actual will is based on the selfish interest of the individual, and the real will is based on the self-interest of the individual. The combination of all, you know, real will is called the general will, and the combination of all actual will is called the will of all. will of all. And today, if you think about the nature of Indian state or government, then you can find that Indian state, as if it is the constitution of all actual will, or the state is behaving like will of all, not by general will. So if people are guided by their real will, then the government will be guided by the general will. If people are guided by the actual will, then the government will be guided by the will of all. So, Jatha, Praja, Tatha, Raja. So, basically, are you selfish interested person or you are self interested person? So, self interest is something good, and selfish interest is all about yourself only. So, Rousseau is saying that once general will is established and it is established because of your real interest. Once general will is established and if general will takes any decision, then you are bound to obey that general will. Otherwise, you are forced to be free. You are forced to be free means that you do not know that there is a real will of yours. And it is because of your real wills, the general will has existed. Hence, the state, the general will has every right to force you 
to force you to obey it because obeying the general will is nothing but making yourself free obeying the general will is nothing but making yourself free so you are forced to be free if you obey the general will then you are actually enjoying your true freedom a freedom that doesn't hinder others what is a true freedom a true freedom is a freedom that doesn't go against others that is a true freedom so for rousseau it is the real will it is not the force and that is the basis of the state so the basis of the state is the real will of the individual and hence the state has every right to prevail upon you right so this is all about your rousseau so you can see how hobbes locke and rousseau has and their philosophy has contributed enormously to the theory of classical liberal theory of democracy so here before i move to different kinds of democracy let's take 5 minutes gap and after 5 minutes again we will assemble together and we will discuss about the different kinds of state it's very interesting i will tell you different features of different kinds of you know democracy different kinds of democratic state or different kinds of democracy and we will enjoy it so you go and have your cup of you know tea or water and we will come after 5 minutes is it okay for all of you Okay, yes, sir.
so i am back so are you all there yes sir yes sir yes sir yes. oh great uh there are uh, you know different kinds of democracy and uh, you know in the morning i said it so how many of you know that how many kinds of democracy are there can anyone tell me how many kinds of democracy are there anyone mokes so we have participatory democracy we have elite democracy representative democracy uh just mention it here okay there are in fact different kinds of democracy and that has been characterized by different bases for example on one basis democracy is divided into two group one is the liberal democracy another is the socialist democracy and another basis democracy again it is divided into two group that is the direct democracy that is representative democracy so you can say that liberal democracy versus socialist democracy direct democracy versus representative democracy presidential democracy versus can anyone tell me presidential democracy yes parliament. parliamentary democracy or oh, that's great dharana and there is elite democracy versus can anyone tell me can anyone tell me elite democracy versus pluralist democracy right and besides that there are deliberative democracy there are uh, you know participatory democracy and there are people's democracy right so there are these are the various kinds of democracy various kinds of classification of democracy and we must have a brief idea about what these democracies are all about right for your sake of understanding then after that in the next class we will discuss about you know elite theory of democracy and the pluralist theory of democracy uh, sorry elite theory of democracy and participatory democracy these are the two democracy that is there in the in your course right so we'll do that in the next class now what is liberal democracy can anyone tell me what is liberal democracy or what are the features of liberal democracy and in a liberal democratic country what is given importance or a liberal democratic country gives importance on what siba sir separation of power okay the liberal democracy uh, encompasses features of classical liberalism uh, which yes. put its much uh, focus on political equality uh, yes. which is uh, political equality means uh, equal power and influence so people should yes. have the right to vote and also stand in an in election yes in, so in short it, uh, it has the features of classical liberalism yes so there are many actually so it, it 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 was not a difficult question i mean liberal democracy can be identified with the existence of freedom of speech freedom of association freedom of religion concept of liberty concept of equality concept of fraternity concept of diversity and concept of minority and these are different areas of research you know people are doing research on freedom of speech people are doing research especially student of political science you can do research on this theme people are doing research on freedom of association 
freedom of religion so i worked my research work is on the on on freedom of religion i worked on religious conversion so that is freedom of religion people are working on the concept of liberty concept of equality concept of welfare state people are also working on you know diversity pluralism multiculturalism people are working on minority rights so all these are different aspects of liberal democracy right so i hope that you have a you know very solid idea on liberal democracy so what is a socialist democracy i mean what are the things that you can you not know, talk within i mean you can you can talk that is related with social democracy anyone i think you just know it you just express yourself and i will say you where you are right and where you are wrong socialist democracy means democracy within socialism yes so when you think about social democracy within socialism then as a state suppose you are the authority of a state of a no you are the authority of a socialist country and as a democrat on what you will give importance on what the past sir yes puja that social democracy uh, protect individual rights no uh, it is associated with economic yes whereby uh, uh, people should have that access to means of uh, 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 resources but also control production yes so social democracy talks about the group over the individual it talks about economic and social intervention to promote the social justice so social democracy talks about social justice and social justice for whom those who are in dis- disadvantaged position those who are broken individual and why social justice in order to bring the sense of equity and equality among people among different groups socialist democracy talks about income redistribution the concept redistribution is frequently uttered in a socialist democratic country it also talks about welfare state because for a socialist democratic country equality is more important than the liberty equality is more important than the liberty why because a society that is based on equality that gives the confidence to a disadvantaged person to exercise his or her liberty in an unequal society the disadvantaged person is always away from his or her individuality and when you are away from your individuality then you cannot enjoy your freedom so equality is the way towards enjoying the freedom then socialist democracy talks about egalitarian outcome that is according work according to your ability and taking according to your needs that is egalitarian outcome then socialist democracy talks about the evolutionary and peaceful transition of society from capitalism to socialism in fact the social democracy or democratic socialism is against the scientific socialism that is marxism for marxism the change will happen the change from capitalism to socialism will happen 
through radicalism through revolution but for social democrats like lohia like joy prakash narayan even to large extent our first prime minister of india jawahar nehru for them the transition of society from capitalism to socialism will not happen through revolution rather than through evolution and through peaceful manner and social democracy gives importance to that now come to the you know right now we are just you know getting a sense of what these democracies are all about right what is a direct democracy can anyone tell me people's participation directly yes and they are very simple all laws are created by the general vote of the society so the representative will not be there so it is the ruled and the ruler the ruler cannot make the rules the ruler may initiate the process and laws will be created by the votes of the society and in a direct democracy citizens are common good oriented if citizens are guided by the private interest then direct democracy will lead to i mean direct democracy is not possible if people are guided by the you know vested interest so direct democracy requires citizens to be common good oriented right then representative democracy what is a representative democracy what are the various features of representative democracy can anyone tell me so they must as can influence the decision but the policy implementation is in, in the hands of the elected representatives that is indirect participation yes in representative democracy there is indirect participation of the people there is political competition and there is political choices so political competition between various leaders belonging to different group different political parties and there are different choice among the voters there is political accountability the ministers are individually and collectively responsible or accountable to the people what is the difference between responsible and accountable in minister context the term accountable is more appropriate than the term responsible accountable means legally responsible that means the individual can sue the government the individual can legally fight against government and the government can also legally fight against individual the state can be sued and be sued s u e that is called the political accountability in representative democracy another feature is the majority rule so if you are winning majority of seats then you form the government that is the majority rule so election is all about winning majority votes election is all about increasing your seats in the parliament then another important aspect of representative democracy is the constitutionalism so what is constitutionalism anyone siba siba are you there oh great can anyone tell me what is constitutionalism Oh, 
According to our constitution. Okay. So when there is a constitution, it means the state is free or state is limited. 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 Yes. So constitutionalism means a limited government. And what are the features of limited government? One of the feature of limited government is a written constitution. So the state is not absolutely free. State is limited by the constitution. So constitutionalism means a limited government. And what is a limited government? A government that is, a more government and a less. I, I mean, no, no. What's a limited government? Actually, it it means. Uh, I'm forgetting that phrase. Actually, uh, Mukesh, can you help me? Uh, it is more governance and less government. It is more responsibility than authority. That is, you know, limited government. That is constitutionalism, right? Then tell me, what is a presidential democracy? Can anyone tell me what is a presidential democracy? Sir, in the presidential form of government, president is the chief executive and elected by the people directly. Yes. So president is the head of the state and head of the government. So if I say that head of the state is equal to head of the government, am I correct? No, sir. What is the difference between head of the state and head of the government? Sir, the Prime Minister is the head of the government and uh, the President is the head of the state. Oh, great, great, great. Rinki, you are my uh, student or you are private self student? Sir, department student. Oh, great, great. Happy, happy. So, what is the difference between this head of the state and head of the government? And why the Prime Minister is the head of the government and President is the head of the state? Can anyone tell me why Prime Minister is the head of the government and President is the head of the state? So as the head of the state, what are the privileges a President enjoys? I will not tell it. You search it. You can find it in your, you know, smartphone is in your hand. I am posing the question. So you try to you know, search the answer in the Google. You can find it. It's not a very difficult question. So in the presidential form of democracy, president is both head of the state and head of the government. So that is the first, you know, important features of presidential democracy. And second important feature of presidential democracy is the separation of executive from the legislature. The separation of executive from the legislature. So executive is completely different. Look at the American system. American president is not part of the legislature. The executive is not part of the legislature. The legislature is something different. The executive is something different. And look at India. The executive is part of the legislature. The executive is part of the legislature. So the two important features of presidential democracy, the first, the separation of executive from the legislature. And second, president is the head of the state and head of the government. These are the two important features of presidential democracy. Then next comes the parliamentary democracy. It is easy. 
So you tell me what are the features of parliamentary democracy? Can anyone tell me? It's easy. It's not so difficult. What by is legislature? Yes. By chemical legislature. By chemical legislature. No, 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 no. In parliamentary democracy, the executive is distinct, but it is the part of the legislature. There is nominal executive and there is real executive. What is a nominal executive? President is sir in parliamentary democracy. President is nominal executive and uh, prime minister is real executive. What is the difference between nominal and real? The nominal means elected by the people directly or indirectly. No. Real means power in real sense. It is in the hand of the prime minister. The prime minister is indirectly elected by the people and the president is elected by the party, not by the people. Party will decide who will be the president, who will be their prime, you know, presidential candidate. And everything happens in a parliamentary democracy in the name of president. In the name of president, everything happens in a parliamentary democracy. And hence, president is the nominal head. He is the head of the state, but not head of the government. The head of the government is the real executive. The head of the state is the nominal executive. And another important feature of parliamentary democracy is collective responsibility. And what is collective responsibility? Can anyone tell me what is collective responsibility? So if one minister of a ministry does some act of omission or act of commission, then the whole ministry is responsible for it. Other minister cannot say that I am not answerable. I am different, he is different. No, no. All are belonging to one political party. All are belonging to government. Hence, all ministers are individually and collectively responsible to the people. That is the collective responsibility. Now come to the elite democracy. What is the elite democracy? Uh, is a rule by uh, selected few from the society who are considered to be intelligent in a, in a certain skills and also yes what is the elite democracy and the real administration run by very few person who are elite and you know Indian democracy can be categorized in several categories of democracy let us understand the elite democracy that the real administration is run by very few persons who are elite. Impossible to participate by all in a democracy. That's why elite democracy must be there. Right? In a democracy, it is impossible for all to participate because it has its own limitations. Hence, elite must rule. And third, stability is achieved through minority rule. If few individual rule, then the possibility of stability is more. If all, everyone rule, then you can find many conflicts, many class of interest, and the stability of the system will be much more poor. So this is, you know, the elite democracy. And what is a pluralist democracy? 
and what are it what are its features what is a pluralist democracy sir in pluralist democracy citizens have power to make decisions no the first feature sir, of plural yes durat sir it is uh, categorized by popular rule no i didn't get it can you say again uh one of the features of this democracy is popular rule one of the feature is popular rule popular rule no I, where I, by I, people I, must no i am not getting you said there is some network problem i think at my end so in a pluralistic democracy the first feature is no single center of power no single center of power state is a association of association that is the slogan of pluralistic democracy on the conception on the concept of state state is the association of association every association is a center of power so state has power along with society has power the trade union is also having the power the caste association is having power the panchayat is also having the power right so the center of power are many no single center of power each idea is centered around a particular center no i am not getting okay i am just leaving it the second feature is that all centers are not equally powerful yes so no single center of power power is there in every centers and all centers are not equally powerful there are different centers of power as i said and all these centers of power are not equally powerful and there is competition among the center of powers there is competition among the center of power let me give you example you know religion is a center of power gender is a center of power now there is a fighting between religion and the gender you know especially in the sahabhanu case in the sahabhanu case the conflict happens between the religious movement versus the gender movement right and you can find one center of power is competing with another center of power and their goal is to achieve the power so one center is against another center in order to maintain its supremacy its domination mm. that is pluralistic or pluralist democracy the next is the deliberative democracy what is a deliberative democracy a democracy that is based on deliberation a democracy that is based on deliberation what is a deliberation can anyone tell me what is deliberation the decision making process sir yes. deliberation means discussion long discussion okay deliberation is a kind of discussion but what is the end of the discussion generally what happens every decision is taken on the basis of majority in each and every decision there is always a minority view and that minority view is suppressed in democracy but deliberative democracy cannot accept the marginalization of that minority from the decision 
right and deliberative democracy tries to incorporate that minority in the decision so the decision will be based on sarva mata unanimous decision right and at least after the deliberation the person who was not in favor of a decision at least he will say that i don't disagree with you i cannot agree with you because i have my own position but i cannot disagree with you now this is the goal of the deliberation so initially before the deliberation the individuals in the minority he was disagreeing to the majority but after the deliberation the minority will not disagree with the decision of the majority so that is the main goal of deliberation and in a deliberative democracy there are five essential characteristics there are five essential characteristics of deliberation so what is the goal of deliberation the goal of deliberation at least to incorporate that minority with the decision of the majority at least the minority will say that i don't disagree with the majority but i cannot agree with the majority so there is a difference and what are the five essential characteristic of a legitimate deliberation the first is the information whether the minority is having the accurate information or not because sometimes lack of information is the cause of your support and of your oppose suppose i am opposing something and i have all the information but you are not having all the information and you may not understand why i take this decision and what i oppose you may support or what i support you may oppose so in deliberative democracy whether information is i mean the accurate information is available with all or not that is taken care of right second the substantive balance dealing with opposite rather than dismissing it right so sub substantive balance that means the majority will not outrightly reject the minority the majority will listen to the minority and the majority should embrace the minority the majority will not outrightly dismiss the minority rather than the majority will deal with the minority at least the ego of minority should be satisfied by the majority that is the substantive balance and the third characteristic of a deliberation is diversity now what is diversity that is the major positions are represented by the participants in the discussion that means let me give you example you know 10 individuals are participating out of 10 individuals seven individuals are supporting and three individuals are opposing or six individuals are supporting and two individuals are opposing sorry four individuals are opposing six are supporting four are objecting and you have to maintain the principles of diversity what does it mean it means that out of that 10 individual let's think that there are three kinds of group or three kinds of position right let me give you example we have directive principles of state policy in our indian constitution 
and it is categorized by liberal principles, socialist principles, and Gandhian principles. Suppose one principle has to be added within the directive principles of state policy, right? So out of ten people in in that example, you know, four people belonging to liberal principles. Three people is represented by socialist principle, and another three people is represented by the Gandhian principle. So four are with the liberal principle, three are with socialist principle, and rest three are with the Gandhian principle. And the decision was taken where. The liberals, sorry, where the Gandhians and the socialists they supported the legislation, and the liberals opposed this, you know, legislation. So, according to the principles of majority, the decision was taken that was supported by. Gandhians and socialists because they constitute three plus three is equal to six. So since they have six votes, and six votes is more than half, more than five, hence that legislation was incorporated in the DPSP, Directive Principles of State Policy. If such thing happens, then there is the violation of diversity principle of deliberative democracy so according to the diversity principles what you need to do now you need to categorize people into different groups different major position and when you are taking any decisions then all these major positions must be represented in the decision you cannot simply dismiss the liberal position you cannot simply dismiss the liberal position when you are dismissing the liberal position then you are dismissing one of the major position in the deliberation so every position must be taken care of in the deliberation then another important characteristic of or essential characteristic of legitimate deliberation is conscientiousness conscientiousness that is participants give merits of the argument there will be no sentiments there will be no support every arguments must be counted on the basis of merit many times you know sentiment emotion that plays a major role of supporting one another but for deliberation even if your enemy your ideological rivalry is putting forth an argument and it has a merit then you should support your adversary because there is merit in his in his or her arguments if you do so then you are having conscientiousness you are having a scientific conscience scientific conscience then equal consideration that arguments needs to be considered on merit and if there is merit in different arguments and different arguments must be treated equally 
if there are merits in different arguments then different arguments must be treated equally so these are the five essential characteristic of a legitimate deliberation the first information third substantive balance second second substantive balance third diversity fourth conscientiousness then fifth the equal consideration so if all these you know characteristics are maintained while taking a decision then i am sure that the minority will say that i do not disagree with you however i cannot agree with you and if such happens we can say that this is a successful deliberation right so i hope that you understand this deliberative democracy you know when i was in hyderabad university one of my good teacher i always consider him as my good teacher he wants me to work on deliberative democracy and i was very good at understanding the deliberative democracy you know there are you know books on deliberative democracy people like david held has worked on it deliberative democracy and i'll be happy if one of you will do work on deliberative democracy in your mphil or phd i can assure you that you will become a good theoretician especially uh, you know on democracy uh, you can offer a you know beautiful alternative to the crisis of democracy then the next category of democracy is participatory democracy what is a participatory democracy citizens are participating in the democratic process yes it advocates for citizen participation it creates conditions for population to make meaningful contribution to the decision meaningful contribution to the decision it is not simple participation it is also enabling people to contribute or to give meaningful contribution with their participation towards decision making that is participatory democracy so it is not the participation of fools it is also making and remaking of individual to participate so that meaningful participation can contribute towards the best decision and participatory democracy is also about apathy it always think and rethink on the question why participation why some participate and some do not in a participatory democracy it is a very central question why some participate in politics and some do not so this is the participatory democracy and the last is the people's democracy what is a people's democracy can anyone tell me what is a people's democracy it is the dictatorship of the proletariat dictatorship of the proletariat and who are the proletariat peasants petty bourgeois they are the proletariat class or progressive bourgeois bourgeois means they are very traditional they are very conservative but all bourgeois are not traditional or conservative there are certain you know progressive bourgeois that join hands with the proletariat class so proletariat class means three categories one is peasants another is petty bourgeois you know they cannot be bourgeois they always face challenges from the bourgeois because bourgeois cannot 
or do not allow the entry of petty bourgeois into their classes. So that's why the petty bourgeois join signed with the proletariat class. And another important constitution of bourgeois or proletariat class is the progressive bourgeois. They constitute the proletariat class. Then this democracy, people's democracy, it is resulted from the revolutionary process. People's democracy is the result of revolution. It is not single party, but a multi-party system. In people's democracy, there should be multi-party. And all these parties come together to counter the fascism. And this integration is people's democracy. So all these parties are the parties of proletariat class. And all these parties must come together to counter fascism, to counter the bourgeois class. And the integration of all these parties in fighting with the bourgeois, fighting against the bourgeois class is a major and important aspect of people's democracy. So these are the various kinds of you know, democracy. I just gave you the brief idea. And in the next class, we will start with the elitist democracy. So I hope in your course courses or in your syllabus, there is only elitist democracy and participatory democracy. Is that Mukesh? Yes, sir. Okay. So in the next class, we will deal with elite democracy and participatory democracy. Now, here I stop my lecture. And if you have any questions on today's discussion, now you can ask me. So any questions are there? So I hope that there is yes, no... Sir. Yes, Durati. Uh, I want to understand the, local, uh, the position of John Locke on people's contribution to government. John Locke and government. Like <laughs> I, the people's yes. contribution to government are supposed to do so. I will do one thing. I will send you a material actually. You read it. Uh, because to explain it, I need again the you know 15 to 20 minutes right uh, i am actually tired right now it's already a two hour classes a two hour class so uh, what i will do in this situation i will send you a material the lock contribution to liberal theory of democracy i think i have said i have said it locks theory uh, locks contribution to the liberal theory of democracy i will send you the link right and you can revisit my lecture. And uh, if you, you know, if you have any problem, then uh, you can use the WhatsApp and you can chat with me. Actually, it's a this question is a very long question. It needs more explanation. So that's why I'm not giving it to you. Right? Okay, sir. Uh, so I think I'm stopping the recording. So if you have any query, you WhatsApp me and through WhatsApp, you can have chat and uh, your doubts can be, you know, clarified. So I'm stopping the recording.